Just how technologically advanced were the ancient civilizations of our world? The answer might surprise you. From ancient sites where the world began to a 300-year-old megagun, let's take a look. Pumapunku The ruins of Pumapunku are some of the most impressive ruins in the world. High in the mountains of Bolivia, Pumapunku is such a dramatic mystery that not only does it baffle modern scientists, but it also shocked the Inca when they came across it. The architectural wonders of Pumapunku are often attributed to the Inca. But the truth is that the people who built this ancient place predate the Inca by a whole lot. It was the civilization known as Tiwanaku who built the structures here 1,500 years ago. It began as a small site but quickly transformed into a fabulous religious center. The cultic hub drew in people from all over the Andes Mountains. In English, Pumapunku translates as Door of the Puma. So, some believe that the Tiwanaku were able to build doors to alternate dimensions or faraway worlds at this place. The Inca believed that Pumapunku was so magical that it must have been the very spot where the gods created the world. But you may be wondering, just what about this site is so incredible? The ancient engineering here is absolutely amazing. Scientists have no idea how Pumapunku was built with such advanced architectural techniques. Even after 1,500 years of wind and rain, the vast temple complex stands strong. The carved blocks were made with incredible precision, almost as if lasers were used to cut the stones. The handiwork is so grand that modern engineers don't even understand how they pulled it off. The Tiwanaku even figured out how to join blocks by using primitive metal staples to keep them tight. It looks as if they drilled holes with machines and then used giant metal staples to bind the rocks together instead of using mortar. The biggest mystery is the end of Pumapunku. Suddenly, at the height of Tiwanaku's prosperity, they came crashing down. Between the years 700 and 1000 AD, about 400,000 people abandoned Pumapunku out of nowhere. But how do so many people disappear from such a glorious city in the blink of an eye? Unfortunately, it's a mystery that may never be solved. Mainstream archaeologists think there was likely social upheaval, maybe the violent kind. Others, however, suggest that the people of Tiwanaku left through stargates to join otherworldly beings. And now for number 7, but first, it's shout-out time! I want to give a big thank you to Maricad Jupi Suvin and Angela Hernandez for supporting this channel. Thank you so much! Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like this. The Moai A very mysterious artifact has been discovered on Easter Island in a volcanic crater. An entirely new Moai statue was recently revealed to the public on this breathtaking Chilean island. But what exactly is a Moai, and what did they mean to the people of Easter Island? Moai are more casually known as the Easter Island Heads, though they are far more than just heads. The Moai are gigantic carved stone figures with heads and bodies, crafted hundreds of years ago from volcanic ash. Nobody has ever been able to figure out why the Easter Island civilization became obsessed with carving the massive stone figures. They almost all look identical, as if they were made from the same molds or like they were produced using the same cookie cutter. The biggest Moai ever found is nicknamed El Gigante, and it definitely lives up to the name. The statue stands an impressive 69 feet tall and weighs nearly 200 tons. The mystery has only deepened with this newly found Moai. This one isn't particularly large, as it's only about 5 feet tall but it was pulled out of marshland in the middle of a crater inside the Ranu Raraku volcano. What's even weirder is that the crater has been home to a laguna for the last 300 years. According to the director of the Rapa Nui National Park, the laguna was over 10 feet deep and it was filled with marshy water. So why was there a moai hidden underneath what was essentially a swamp in a volcanic pit? It's just another piece of the baffling mystery that is Easter Island. Magic Roman Gems In the ancient Roman port city of Claterna, recent excavations have revealed a spectacular collection of artifacts. Over 3,000 pieces of silver, gold, and bronze were recovered. Most of the pieces were coins, but 50 gems were also found during the investigation. The gems are particularly exciting because they were engraved with images of Roman deities. These were magical gems that were unearthed in a truly magical city. 
During the days of the Roman Empire, Claterna was a prosperous place, but now it's completely destroyed, and the whole city is buried under miles of grassy hills and trees. Archaeologists have had a difficult time trying to understand the full scope of the ruins because they're buried so deep. However, excavations have revealed roads and highways, Roman baths, and even a massive theater. It was most certainly a big and important place. So much so, in fact, that Lucia Borgonzoni from the culture ministry called Claterna the Pompeii of the North. Some of the coins that were discovered were minted as early as 97 BC. This suggests that Claterna was already an extremely important place during the Roman Republic. But what about the magical gems? Archaeologists believe that they were likely meant to be commemorative items given to pilgrims visiting the city. They were engraved with Roman deities and structures that likely stood in Claterna. They wouldn't have granted anybody magical abilities. After all, there weren't any wizards in the Roman Republic, but the gems may have made whoever carried them feel like they had at least some protection from their gods. The Viking Sunstone The Viking Sunstone is both a piece of ancient technology and an impressive relic. Icelandic texts from the Middle Ages describe how the Vikings figured out that they could use a simple stone to navigate the hostile waters of the open ocean. It was with the sunstone that the Vikings were able to travel to faraway lands. It's how they became the first Europeans to arrive in both North America and Iceland. There was a big difference between the sailors in Spain and Greece and the sailors in Scandinavia. Spain and Greece and everywhere else in the Mediterranean are blessed with huge amounts of sun. But in Scandinavia, the skies are frequently overcast. This makes it difficult for early Norse navigators to find their way while at sea, since they couldn't see the sun or the stars to help them traverse the ocean. People in the Mediterranean didn't have that big of a problem because the sun was always out. So Scandinavians had to come up with a new technology. And that technology was the sunstone, allowing them to navigate in the harshest of weather. The sunstone is a very simple piece of rock. And that's all it is, just a hunk of stone. Vikings used naturally occurring minerals that have polarizing properties, like a colorless crystalline material called Iceland's bar. Any kind of crystalline rock devoid of any color worked just fine. Even when the sky was cloudy, Vikings could hold the sunstone to the heavens and discover the exact location of the sun. Unfortunately, though, no physical example has ever been found of a sunstone used by Vikings. Scholars only know Vikings used them because they told stories about them. The Tao In every ancient civilization, humans figured out how to build ships. But they weren't always the same. In North America, Native Americans built canoes. And so too did the Maya and the Aztec. In Europe, they built ships that could take to the oceans, opening up trade route possibilities. The Vikings used their long ships to raid Russian and British coastlines. But in India and many other parts of Asia, they used something called a Tao. The Tao is an excellent example of how human beings invented similar technologies around the world but used different methods. The Tao was made with a triangular sail, which was its most distinctive feature. But instead of its hull being nailed together with crude copper nails, the boards of the hull were sewn together with plant fibers. Basically, the Tao was a vegetarian ship. And yet, it dominated the waters of the Indian Ocean all the way up until the 15th century. That was when Portuguese explorers brought their shipbuilding methods to Asia. The Greeks witnessed the boats for themselves in the 1st century AD off the coast of Zanzibar. Even Marco Polo recorded his encounter with the strange sewn ships when he entered the Persian Gulf. Marco Polo wrote that the planks were stitched together with twine and couldn't be corroded by seawater. However, the fiber-made boats were seriously susceptible to storms. Ancient Hydraulics The ancient Egyptians understood how to manipulate the natural world thousands of years ago using sophisticated hydraulic engineering. Researchers recently documented a sprawling network of stone walls along the Nile River. And when I say sprawling, I really mean sprawling. The stone walls are spread across over 600 miles of the Nile. Over a period of 3,000 years, they were built to control the river, preventing floods and controlling the body of water's flow. The walls stretch all the way from Egypt to Sudan, and they were uncovered by scientists using satellite photography. Researchers looked through aerial photographs that were taken over the decades, and at more recent satellite pictures as well. 
In total, they managed to document over 1,200 wall segments. They're calling the walls groinies, specifically referring to structures used in ancient hydraulics. And although most of them are ancient, some were built only a few decades ago to prevent flooding. Different segments vary in size. Researcher Matthew Dalton from the University of Western Australia said that some of the walls were built by an individual or a small group. This would have been a project that only took a few days. But other examples are huge, undoubtedly built by a large force of laborers. One of the biggest portions was found at an ancient site called Soleb in Sudan, stretching 2,300 feet and made up of over 1,680 tons of rock. Chavin de Wantar The ancient ritual site of Chavin de Wantar is a place of magic, mysticism, and scientific understanding. Located in Peru, the first stones were laid here long before any of the famous Andean civilizations rose to power. In fact, it was already in ruins 1,700 years before the Inca existed. The temple complex was built around 900 BC. Then it was expanded around 400 years later to include an even larger structure. And by the time it was abandoned 2,200 years ago, the temple was full of underground tunnels, galleries, maze-like structures, and subterranean chambers of darkness. While studying the baffling underground passageways, archaeologists have made some amazing revelations. But the biggest one is that the temple was designed like a massive sound amplifier. When I say sound amplifier, I mean that the temple was essentially a loudspeaker. Studies have shown that the acoustics of the temple were so potent that the building would have quivered with the voice of a god. From a central chamber deep inside, a single man's voice could have been amplified by a lot. His voice would have filled the underground corridors and burst out at the surface, as if a deity's booming words emanated from the air itself. It would have taken a lot of scientific understanding to create a building with such impressive acoustics. So, archaeologists believe that Chavin de Huantar was used in extremely important mystic ceremonies. Also, the temple likely used a lot more than sound in these ceremonies. Aromas, light, noise, and hallucinogens would have all played a part in whatever happened here. People likely would have dosed themselves in mescaline, which comes from a locally grown cactus. Then, once the participants were, for lack of a better term, whacked out of their gourds, the ritual would have begun. Conch shells would have been blown deep inside the galleries to generate incredible sound. And this could have mimicked the roar of a puma or the screech of another animal. Sadly, though, there are no details on exactly what happened inside this great temple. Scientists only know how it works, not why it was created in the first place. The Puckle Gun In 1718, an English lawyer developed the very first machine gun. It seems crazy to think that machine guns have been around for 300 years, but it's true. James Puckle patented and developed the Puckle Gun at the very beginning of the 18th century. It was an automatic weapon that fired round bullets and square bullets, but why it had two different bullets is going to blow your mind. Maybe I should stop for a second and give you a chance to guess. In the 18th century, why would a gun need to fire two differently shaped bullets? If your guess had anything to do with religion, you were 100% correct. The round bullets were designed to be fired at Christians. Square bullets, on the other hand, were designed to be fired at Turks, or any Muslim person for that matter. But why was that? It was because round bullets were more humane. Puckle was a bright enough scientist to understand that round bullets caused a quicker and cleaner death, whereas square bullets would cause more tissue damage. More tissue damage meant increased suffering and a longer, drawn-out death. So, it was his conclusion that people of non-Christian descent should have significantly more painful deaths. Now, let me move along to how the gun functioned. It was mounted to a tripod and was equipped with a single-board barrel. It looked like a medieval Gatling gun. The weapon fired bullets using a multi-chambered revolving cylinder and a matchlock firing mechanism. It wasn't the very first multi-shot gun developed, but its destructive potential was higher than anything before it. Even the Gatling gun that came later copied the design of the Puckle gun. The thought was that the gun could be installed on warships and be used to obliterate other vessels. This would have been devastating to a less developed civilization that didn't have any guns at all. But maybe the craziest thing about the gun was that it worked. It was a real killing machine. It didn't become mainstream though because it was too expensive and too hard to build. The British Navy took a huge interest in the weapon, as did private investors. 
but there were a few glaring problems that prevented it from seriously taking off. Although it worked, it was difficult to use. Soldiers would have needed to be specially trained, which was something armies didn't have time for. It was also extraordinarily heavy and too stationary. It couldn't be used on the front lines of a battle because it took too much time to set up and deploy. Gun warfare was already advancing in the 18th century, so armies knew what they wanted. And what they wanted were lightweight guns that were easy to use and quick to fire. The puckle gun, although devastating in the right situation, was too impractical to be manufactured on a large scale. It took three guys just to reload the weapon. So, by 1722, the puckle gun was dismissed as an unusable prototype. Thanks for watching! Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed! The Giza Transmitters The greatest piece of advanced technology in the ancient world may very well have been the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's believed that the Egyptian pyramids were originally designed to be gigantic energy transmitters. There are theories that claim the Great Pyramid was a large machine, not a stone tomb. In the past, the structure may have been capable of producing and transmitting energy, perhaps electromagnetic frequencies. It could have acted as a kind of power plant that would harness energy from the Earth's vibrations and then convert that energy into pure electricity. But if this is true, who was using that electricity? The answer is most likely the ancient Egyptians. If the pyramids really were oversized batteries, they would have been used to distribute clean and limitless energy to the people of ancient Egypt. This means that thousands of years ago, the Egyptians would have had lights and power. But the problem is that nobody has ever found any archaeological evidence of this. As far as historians are aware, the Egyptians never had any kind of electricity or power. So, the bizarre theory is this. If the ancient Egyptians weren't using the electricity from the pyramids for themselves, it's likely that someone else was benefiting from it. One theory is that the giant pyramid-shaped energy transmitters could have been used for recharging alien ships. It sounds outrageous, but some scholars agree that Egyptians did have contact with extraterrestrials. It's possible the aliens helped the Egyptians build the pyramids so they could power their own vessels and then they took their advanced technology with them when they left. What do you think about this? Let me know in the comments below! The Greek Laptop Daudis was a famous painter in ancient Athens between 500 and 460 BC. Back in those days, people didn't paint on large canvases, but instead left their artwork on solid pottery. Throughout his long career as an artist, Daudis completed an estimated 300 vases. Archaeologists know he was popular among the Greeks because he often signed his name on vases that he didn't even paint, sort of like an ancient autograph. This suggests his artwork was also reproduced, similar to how you can find imitations of any famous artist's work today. It's likely that people would have recreated his pottery in order to sell them for a huge profit. But there's something even stranger. One of the vases painted by Daudis appears to show a man busily working on a laptop. It seems to be proof of highly advanced technology used by the ancient Greeks. The vase depicts a man sitting in a chair. He is hunched over what looks like a laptop, and he even has a stylus pen in one hand. Some say this is evidence of either time travel or ancient Greek computers. However, archaeologist Janet Grossman says it's all just conspiracy nonsense. She claims the object isn't a laptop, but a wax writing tablet used in ancient Greece. This is a compelling argument, although some still say it's difficult to explain the possible USB port that can be seen on the side of the so-called wax tablet. Viking GPS Medieval Vikings always knew where they were going, and it was all thanks to an extremely primitive GPS. It was more of a fancy compass but it was still the first kind of positioning system that was ever used by humans. The Vikings may have been ruthless warriors, but they were also some of the best mariners of their time. They were capable of traveling all across the North Atlantic in an almost perfect straight line, from Scandinavia all the way to Canada. They did this with the help of innovative technology that the world had never seen before. The supposedly barbaric Vikings invented a miraculous compass 
that worked even when the sun had dipped below the horizon. This amazing tool was discovered in Greenland by archaeologists in 1948. The device has since been called the Unartok disk. It was a navigational tool used by the Vikings 1,000 years ago to travel from Norway to Greenland, a journey of 1,600 miles. Researchers believe that although the small wooden disk could have functioned alone, it was likely used with other tools, such as crystals and a flat slab of wood. Back then, it was almost impossible to navigate when the sun was down, since you can't track the sun if it's not in the sky. To solve this issue, the Vikings used crystal sunstones, which are natural calcite stones that produce specific patterns when exposed to the UV rays of sunlight. When the crystals are held in the sky, even after sunset, they can still pinpoint the sun's position underneath the horizon. The Vikings used these crystals, along with their wooden compass device, to track the sun through the night, allowing them to complete long journeys across the sea with extreme navigational accuracy. The Colosseum The Romans were responsible for a lot of fantastic inventions, as well as advanced pieces of technology. They were able to cut stone with the same precision as modern stonemasons. They carved complex underground wonders and even pioneered nanotechnology. However, one of the most impressive pieces of engineering in ancient Rome was the Colosseum. To this day, the Colosseum is the largest amphitheater ever built, and yet it's almost 2,000 years old. Researchers are still baffled that the structure was ever finished and that the Romans ever embarked upon such a seemingly impossible task in the first place. The idea for the Roman Colosseum began under the rule of Emperor Vespasian in the year 70 AD. It took about two years of planning, but construction began in 72 AD. Unfortunately, there are no records of the chief architect behind the design, and we don't know the specifics of what went on during the construction. All we know is that it was completed in the year 80 AD under Emperor Titus, Vespasian's heir. But why did the Romans build the Colosseum in the first place? Historians believe it was created to appease an angry population. The people of Rome were upset after the rule of Emperor Nero, who was arguably the worst Roman leader in history. To show that he wasn't as heartless and awful as Nero had been, Emperor Vespasian wanted to make something that would exhibit the glory and strength of Rome. They also hoped that the general population would be distracted and entertained with bloodshed in the Colosseum. This would make it easier for those in power to carry on with their dirty political work. The Colosseum required about 3.5 million cubic feet of stone, which was pulled out of the quarry near modern Tivoli. Similar amounts of Roman concrete, bricks, and volcanic rock were also needed for its construction. However, the concrete is what allowed the structure to be so solid. Then, to finish the magnificent amphitheater, 300 tons of iron clamps were used in order to hold everything together. Iron from the Sky King Tutankhamun was born sometime around the year 1341 BC. He was the son of Pharaoh Akhenaten, who was one of the most hated pharaohs in Egyptian history. He was removed from power after ruling for 17 years, and nine-year-old Tutankhamun took his place on the throne. Sadly, the young boy passed away from a gangrene infection just 10 years later. His body was buried in the Valley of the Kings, like all the pharaohs that came before him. His tomb was sealed and lost, but was discovered again in 1922 by Howard Carter, a British archaeologist. The tomb was filled with all kinds of amazing treasures and was an absolute gold mine of extraordinary items. One of the unexpected discoveries was a dagger with an iron blade and a decorative gold handle. The dagger was an unexpected find because it was the only thing made of iron in the tomb. In the days of Tutankhamun, iron was considered extremely rare and was more valuable than gold because it was not something the Egyptians had access to. Archaeologists have only found a few iron items from that time period, and most of them came from outer space. It's believed that the dagger King Tut was wearing had been fashioned from a meteorite. Archaeologists even know the exact meteorite the iron came from. Its name is Karga, and it was discovered about 150 miles west of Alexandria. We know this based on the composition of iron, nickel, and cobalt from King Tut's knife which matches exactly with the Karga meteorite. 
Even without the ability to extract raw iron, the Egyptians somehow knew how to fashion a meteorite into a dagger. And now for number five. But first, it's shout out time. I want to give a big thank you to Rolando Ochoa and American Joe TV for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing discoveries and strange history. Tesla's anti gravity machine. Nikola Tesla was such a magnificent genius that some think he may have been an alien. But this theory has been proven untrue since we know Tesla was born in Croatia to Serbian parents in 1856. However, some of the inventions he created throughout his career seemed completely out of this world. In 1928, Tesla registered a patent for a flying machine that looked like a hybrid between a helicopter and an airplane. It was a proposed spaceship that would utilize anti-gravity technology to propel itself through the cosmos. Before the famous inventor died, he revealed the blueprints for the propulsion system of his amazing aircraft. He called it a space drive and claimed it was an anti-electromagnetic field propulsion system. Unfortunately, Tesla's creation was never brought to life, and we haven't seen an anti-gravity machine that really works. But Tesla supposedly figured it out almost a century ago. Then, for whatever reason, his technology was forgotten. Puma Punku's Stonework One of the most incredible places in all of Bolivia is the ruined temple complex of Puma Punku. It's located near the city of Tiwanaku and its origin is considered a mystery. The complex was thought to have been built during the height of the Tiwanaku Empire, which thrived between 300 and 1000 AD. They were one of the most powerful civilizations in South America before the rise of the Inca Empire and the arrival of the Spanish. The most fascinating thing that can be found in Puma Punku is its stonework. The buildings here were constructed using highly advanced techniques that haven't been seen anywhere else in Bolivia or Peru. Megalithic blocks, each one weighing several tons, were stacked so precisely that they are still interlocked like puzzle pieces. These immense stones fit together so perfectly that you can't even slide a razor blade between them. These blocks were created with machine-like qualities, and they even had holes drilled into them as if they had access to power tools. This was a civilization that hadn't even figured out how to write, and yet their stonework can hardly be recreated today. Because of this, some have speculated that the people of Puma Punku may have had help from extraterrestrial visitors. Ancient Aluminum A mysterious object was discovered on the muddy shores of the Muris River in Romania. It was buried at a depth of about 33 feet and was originally found in 1973. What made the discovery so shocking was that the piece of metal, some form of aluminum, was estimated to be roughly 250,000 years old. That would mean it's been around since before humanity started working with metal long before we even left the comfort of our cozy caves. The mysterious object is the source of a lot of controversy. Archaeologists say it's an extremely lightweight metal that was likely manufactured. It's 90% aluminum, and some experts believe it could have come from alien visitors. Because of how deep it was found in the mud, there is no way that anyone accidentally lost the random object. Maybe it was a fragment of a UFO that fell off the craft, like a loose bolt. But there are those who say it could also be the byproduct of human engineering from a quarter of a million years ago. Experts are stumped, and nobody knows for sure where it came from. These days, the mysterious metal object is on display at a history museum in Romania. The curators of the museum still say its origin is unknown. The Roman Goblet An incredibly smart Roman designed and built a chalice that could change color using nanotechnology 1,600 years ago. It's called the Lycurgus Cup, and it looks like any ordinary cup from the end of the Roman Empire. It depicts King Lycurgus of Thrace in an epic scene, which is how it earned its name. But what makes the chalice so remarkable is that depending on the direction the light hits it, it's a totally different color. When the cup is lit from the front, it's a bright green, but when the light hits it from the back, it turns blood red. Archaeologists at the British Museum were given the glass chalice in the 1950s, although it's unclear exactly where it came from. It wasn't until 40 years later that researchers in England looked at fragments of the chalice under a microscope. 
This is when they discovered that the Roman artisan who crafted the chalice used nanotechnology. They put particles of gold and silver inside the glass, each particle only being about 50 nanometers in diameter. That's significantly smaller than one grain of table salt. It was highly meticulous work that couldn't have possibly been an accident. The Roman artisan perfected the use of nanoparticles to change the look of the chalice based on the direction of the light. According to archaeologist Ian Freestone from University College London, the cup changes color because of electrons in the metal flex. The electrons vibrate at a certain frequency that changes the color depending on the way you look at the chalice. This is extremely advanced science and way beyond what we imagine the Romans were capable of. It's also the only surviving example of such technology ever being used. Giant Stone Boxes Ancient aliens may have built giant stone boxes in Egypt about 3,300 years ago. At the Serapium of Saqqara, a large cemetery near Memphis, archaeologists found something unbelievable. Underground stone boxes were uncovered here, and historians say they were used to bury sacred bulls. Each box weighs roughly 100 tons and was crafted from pure granite. What makes these stone boxes so shocking is that they were made with 21st century precision. Brian Forrester, an expert on ancient Egypt, says the tomb in which the giant stone boxes were found was also made with incredible accuracy. The angles of the tomb are almost exactly 90 degrees, and the interior is within a couple ten thousandths of an inch from being perfectly flat. Someone built an amazingly advanced tomb and filled it with giant boxes for burying sacred Egyptian bulls. The extreme precision of the boxes is the reason some believe it was aliens who created them. But then again, did the Egyptians really need aliens to help them with their construction? We already know the Egyptians boasted an advanced knowledge of geometry. They were able to estimate pi, and they knew how to find the volume of a truncated pyramid. Based on this, it's not hard to believe they were able to make smooth surfaces and carve massive blocks of granite. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Dragonfire In the year 672 AD, the Byzantine Empire learned how to concoct a miracle weapon that would burn their enemies to ash. It was called Greek fire, and the inventor was supposedly an architect by the name of Callinicus of Heliopolis. He served under Emperor Constantine Pogonatus and was allegedly one of the greatest minds the empire ever saw. Callinicus was so brilliant that he created a merciless weapon that scientists still haven't been able to replicate. Greek fire was a miracle for one main reason. It would burn on any surface, even on water. It would take down entire ships when they were sprayed with it, and it was so effective the Byzantines used it until the 13th century. It was as if they had harnessed fire from the very belly of a dragon. Most modern scientists believe petroleum was at least one of the ingredients in the concoction. There had likely been sulfur and other unknown materials added as well. However, nobody knows the exact composition, or even how the fire was sparked in the first place. Once ignited, though, the substance burned with the fury of a thousand suns and could only be extinguished with sand or vinegar. In battle, the Byzantines would launch Greek fire from their galleys using siphons like primitive flamethrowers. Number 9. The Vimana According to the Ramayana, an ancient Sanskrit epic from India and a source of important Hindu legends, the Vimana is a flying machine. The Ramayana describes the Vimana as an aerial chariot that can go everywhere at will, something that resembles a bright cloud soaring through the sky. It's supposedly a massive metallic construct made for Brahma, the god of creation in Hindu mythology. There are other descriptions of the Vimana in old Indian lore. It's sometimes described as a flying ship or a floating temple, and has even been likened to a palace seven stories high. It's often depicted as a singular vehicle used only by certain gods, but in other accounts, it's a type of transport vessel that was common thousands of years ago. Some have even wondered if the legend of the Vimana was inspired by flying saucers that came down from the sky near the dawn of civilization in India.
Whatever the Vimana was, nobody has ever found a real physical example, but there have been rumors circulating recently that one such flying vehicle was discovered in a cave in Afghanistan. The story goes a group of US soldiers came upon the artifact, but that's all we know. The flying machine that was recovered is said to be at least 5,000 years old, but is now hidden in an unknown location. The Hierapolis Sawmill the Hierapolis Sawmill was one of the greatest inventions of the Roman Empire. It was built at Hierapolis, located in modern Turkey, and is considered the first machine in the world to create a crank slider mechanism by combining a crank and a connecting rod. This invention was a major leap forward in mechanical tech. At its core, this machine was a fully functioning automatic sawmill that didn't require any human assistance. It was fitted with a water wheel that powered a gear train attached to a pair of frame saws. The water pushed the wheel, which then turned the connecting rod and crank, effectively powering the saws. All a human worker needed to do was put down a block of wood or solid rock and the crank mechanism would work the saws for them automatically cutting through pretty much any material. Many historians believe it was ingenious mechanisms like this which allowed early civilizations to make precise cuts on blocks of stone. Underground Corridors a road construction project in Iran recently led to the miraculous discovery of a mysterious underground network in the northeast village of Bam. Researchers believe the buried corridor is directly connected to the nearby ancient fortress of shar e belkais or the city of Belkais. The city of Belkais is the second biggest mud fortress in Iran and is roughly 6,000 years old. It was occupied for thousands of years before flourishing in the Sassanid era between 224 and 661. It continued to be in use until the early 18th century, making it one of the longest continuously inhabited places on the planet. What makes the old fortress so impressive is that it was built entirely out of mud. These ancient people built a fortified city, dug irrigation channels, constructed large houses and citadels, and for the most part only used mud. That in itself is a technological marvel, and it's a wonder that a city sculpted from wet mud is still standing today. Archaeologists have suspected the existence of something secret underground, but only recently uncovered it. Amazingly, the city was not only grand above ground, but also extensive below the earth. There are over 11 miles of corridors hiding below this dry, hilly region of Iran. The tunnels are complete with bathrooms, a mill, underground houses, and more that experts have still yet to examine. It's hard to imagine how such an immense underground metropolis was carved into the hills. The Brahmastra the Brahmastra is a weapon from Hindu mythology that's supposedly so powerful it can destroy the entire universe, not just planet Earth, but every last scrap of creation and every living being anywhere. It was created by Brahma, and the way it's described in Hindu myth almost makes it seem like a nuclear warhead. The Brahmastra is described as a fiery weapon that creates a great fireball, blazing with flames and emitting countless flashes of thunder. When discharged, the Brahmastra destroys all nature, killing the trees, poisoning the ocean, and even filling the sky with fire. Weirdly enough, the weapon also causes lingering damage. It's said that not a single blade of grass will grow from the area the Brahmastra struck and that the sky will be devoid of rain for years and years. It sounds a lot like the devastation after releasing nuclear energy. Could the weapon be a figment of someone's imagination? Or was the Brahmastra based on a real device with nuclear capabilities? We've already seen in Hindu mythology that they had massive flying machines and could navigate the stars. Maybe they also had nuclear weapons, or at least came in contact with a more advanced civilization who showed them the destructive power of the bomb. The Turtle Ship The Turtle Ship was one of the first true warships in the world, an unbelievably powerful piece of advanced technology. The vessel turned the tides of the war in the 15th century and was invented by the Royal Korean Navy used to fight off the invading Japanese. It was utilized along with another highly advanced ship called Panoxion, which used an oar and sail to help outmaneuver its opponents. However, the turtle ship was innovative in that the crew inside was protected by a shell-like covering. Technically, this ship was the very first armored water vessel in the world, 
with the first prototype being completed in 1413 or 1415. But it was between 1592 and 1598 when the turtle ship went down in history as one of the greatest military vessels ever created. Japanese samurai Toyotomi Hideyoshi, a man who grew to be the second great unifier of Japan, tried to conquer Korea. The Korean admiral Yi Sun Sin then improved the design of the turtle ship, which was so impressive that the Japanese had no defense or offense against it. The admiral went on to win 16 out of 16 battles, smashing the Japanese navy to pieces. The main feature of the ship was its defense. It had a massive closed deck with a turtle-like shell covered in spikes that protected everyone on board. It also had a dragon head mounted to the front that blew sulfur smoke. This disguised the movements of the ship in battle, allowing it to sail swiftly through a fog of sulfur. It could quickly ramp up speed, allowing it to smash into the enemy vessel like a battering ram, and effectively obliterated the weaker Japanese boats. Roman Fridge Archaeologists excavating the Roman fortress of Nove came across an unexpected piece of technology. Surprisingly, they found an ancient refrigerator in the old legionary fortress that once formed a defensive barrier along the Danube in northern Bulgaria. The fortress was likely built in the first century, around the year 86 AD. It was a base of operations for Roman soldiers as they fought against the barbarian hordes in the Dacian Wars. The fighting went on for nearly a century, and even after they had ended, the fortress remained standing. It was then used again during the Byzantine period in the 6th and 7th centuries. Excavations have been going on at the fortress for several decades, with various types of artifacts being exhumed from the ruins. However, it was only recently that a team of researchers from the University of Warsaw found the primitive fridge. It was a container made from ceramic plates that was recessed into the floor of a building. In other words, it was like a cubbyhole tucked underneath the ground to use the coldness of the earth to its advantage. The team also found pieces of ceramic vessels, a bowl of charcoal, and small baked bones inside the container. The charcoal could have been used to keep insects away from the fridge, which they likely filled with all their favorite beverages and baked meats. Pretty impressive for almost 2,000 years ago. Mysterious Stone Spheres On the Greek island of Santorini, over 700 mysterious stones have been discovered by archaeologists. These small, oddly similar pieces of rock were carved into small orbs between 3600 and 4500 years ago. These stone spheres were found in the ruined town of Akrotiri, a potential location for the mythical city of Atlantis. Akrotiri was a Cycladic Bronze Age settlement that flourished with highly advanced technology and had a progressive social structure. Sadly, it was destroyed around the 16th century BC by a volcanic eruption. The city vanished in the blink of an eye, carpeted with hot volcanic ash. However, it remained preserved underneath the soot until the first excavations began in 1967. Since then, archaeologists have uncovered beautiful frescoes, unique artifacts, and 700 strange stones. Considering Akrotiri may have been the inspiration behind Atlantis, these rocks have been particularly interesting. Each one is similar, but not exactly alike. They've also been eroded over time, and so nobody was able to tell just what they were used for. Yet according to Dr. Konstantinos Trimis from the University of Bristol, other similar stones have been found in Crete, Cyprus, and other Greek islands. Were these curious stone spheres part of some ancient technology, or were they part of an unknown hobby practiced by ancient humans in the Mediterranean? In order to find the answer, researchers used artificial intelligence to examine the common features of the 700 stones. Shockingly, they discovered that the rocks weren't used in slingshots or for keeping records, but they were pieces of an ancient board game. Unfortunately, scientists don't know how the game was played. All they know is that these small stone spheres, some of them roughly the size of golf balls, were pivotal in playing the mysterious game. If Akrotiri really was Atlantis, this could have been an advanced board game enjoyed by real Atlanteans thousands of years ago. Advanced Flint Tools Advanced flint tools were discovered 50 years ago in the Tunnel Wilki cave in Poland. The tools have now been dated to half a million years old, which came as a massive shock because they were initially thought to only be 40,000 years old. 
A new study done by researchers at the Faculty of Archaeology of the University of Warsaw uncovered the truth. These flint instruments are likely the oldest creations ever found in Poland. The cave in which these mysterious pieces of ancient tech were discovered goes back at least 550,000 years. Within the cave, researchers also unearthed the bones of extinct monsters, such as remnants of a Eurasian cave lion and scraps of Mosbachian wolves and lycaons. The flint relics were found in the same layer of sediment as the extinct animal bones. These weren't the most advanced tools that have ever been made, and they definitely weren't created using alien technology. However, they were highly prized tech for ancient humans. Archaeologists identified flint scrapers and tiny flint knives, both of which were likely used to process animal carcasses. They were invented, perhaps, by an ancient subspecies of human named Homo heidelbergensis, who lived in Poland during this period of time. The humans that possessed these flint knives would have been able to catch and eat more food than those without them. The Downfall of Angkor The Khmer Kingdom in Cambodia was one of the greatest empires the world has ever seen. They built what many would argue is still the most impressive temple complex anywhere on the planet. Angkor was one of the largest cities in Asia during its time. The construction techniques for the temples were highly advanced, the city planning was revolutionary, and the sheer area taken up by Angkor was unprecedented. Researchers with NASA recently used ground-sensing radar to fully map the area of the ancient Cambodian capital. They discovered it to be 400 square miles, nearly four times larger than the city of Philadelphia, and only 100 square miles smaller than Phoenix. Although that may not sound too impressive, Keep in mind this was 800 years ago. For its time, Angkor was truly enormous. Angkor was the capital of the Khmer Kingdom from between the 9th and 16th centuries. The most famous temple complex, Angkor Wat, was built in the middle of the city, likely around the 12th century. One of the biggest mysteries surrounding the old capital is that nobody has ever been able to figure out why it was abandoned. But now, researchers are blaming its size. Damien Evans from the University of Sydney believes the advanced structure of the city was what ultimately caused its downfall. Angkor was just too ahead of the curve. The vast amount of land they cleared to make rice fields ultimately caused ecological damage. They continued to spread their neighborhoods farther from the center, leading to deforestation, overpopulation, and the degradation of their soil. Angkor moved too quickly into the modern world which forced the city to burn out and collapse. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. The Hanging Pillar There is a small village in India called Lipakshi, and it's home to a plethora of amazing and inexplicable examples of ancient technology. The village is less than 100 miles from the city of Bangalore. Within the village is a miraculous hanging pillar the footprint of a goddess, and a group of mysterious stone circles. There is a massive impression stomped into the stone within the temple complex at Lepakshi. The footprint is roughly three and a half feet in length and was supposedly left by the goddess Sita. Then there is the unbelievable hanging pillar. It's the main attraction of the little village and an unexplainable piece of ancient technology. When India was first colonized by the British, Engineers tried to dislodge the pillar from its place, but failed. Even these days, scientists don't understand how the pillar is fixed to the ceiling, but doesn't physically touch the ground. It violates every law of gravity, hanging suspended above the stone floor so that you can sweep cloth and pieces of paper underneath it. These stone circles are half mystery and half ancient technology. Much like the goddess footprint, these circles are imprints left in the stone on the floor of the temple complex, but nobody's sure what they are. Each imprint consists of a main circle surrounded by 10 smaller circles, each one perfectly round. It looks as though they were made by some huge piece of machinery, but no one knows what they mean. Leather Scale Armor An almost complete set of leather scale armor was discovered inside an ancient tomb in northwest China. Researchers from the University of Zurich believe the armor originated in the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the 6th century BC, then found its way to China. It was uncovered in the tomb of a horse-riding warrior near Turfan. This was a major technological advancement in the world of warfare. 
Scale armor was unique in that it protected the vital organs of the warrior wearing it. Scale armor was almost like having an extra layer of skin on, durable yet malleable so that it didn't restrict mobility. The best scale armor was made through a meticulous process of patching together individual plates shaped like shields. These plates were arranged in horizontal rows, and it was a painstaking job. Because most armies were quite large in the ancient world, warriors didn't have access to such lavish forms of protection. Leather scale armor like this would not have been used by the common soldier. This particular set is extremely impressive. It was made around the year 786 BC from 5,444 small scales, each one stitched onto a solid backing. There were also 140 larger scales, altogether creating a waistcoat protecting the torso, hips, sides, and lower back. It would have been shrugged on like a coat. The big mystery is that scientists aren't sure if it was created by a Chinese warrior, stolen from an Assyrian corpse, or worn by an Assyrian mercenary fighting in China for unknown reasons. The Roman Road A Roman road from 2,000 years ago was recently discovered in England, in a small town in Worcestershire. Archaeologists say there is nothing else like it except for Pompeii and the city of Rome itself. Workmen digging in a field near an abandoned Roman settlement were the ones who came across its remains. The road is about 9 feet wide, made from large stones laid in the traditional Roman fashion to create a flat, drivable avenue. Local archaeologist Aidan Smith believes it's definitely a Roman road from the 1st century AD, which will make it the only one of its kind ever found in Britain. But 2,000 years ago, this road was only one piece of a much larger network connecting various Roman cities and towns. The technology was so advanced that the road remained hidden under several feet of dirt for thousands of years and is still almost in perfect condition. The stones were placed with expert precision, made specifically for wagons and convoys. People would have been able to walk these roads and feel relatively safe while journeying from one destination to the next. This was a major upgrade from having to travel along dirt paths through the woods and potentially be robbed. The old adage, every road leads to Rome, is because the Romans really did create the first superhighways. Their roads across Europe connected the continent in a way that had never been done before, allowing for easy travel and increased trade. But it's the durability of the roads that really speaks to their technological prowess. Most modern roads crack and break within a few years, but Roman roads last for centuries, with barely any damage. The Hipparchus Star Catalog Researchers affiliated with the University of Cambridge recently discovered fragments of an ancient manuscript about 2,100 years old. It's called the Hipparchus Star Catalog, authored by the brilliant Greek astronomer Hipparchus between 170 and 120 BC. The paper is the oldest known piece of evidence in which a human used numerical coordinates to try and pinpoint the exact position of a star. This was a major innovative breakthrough in the realm of astronomy. The text was unfortunately erased several centuries later so that the pages could be reused. Researchers only identified the fragments of text by using multispectral imaging technology. They had to look underneath the scribblings of ancient astronomer Claudius Ptolemy, who had written over Hipparchus's work 400 years later to make his own catalog. What's a little ironic about the situation is that Hipparchus' measurements were more accurate than the man who copied over his manuscripts. Hipparchus successfully detailed the celestial longitudes and latitudes of almost 900 stars in the night sky. This wasn't exactly an ancient technology, but it was a huge leap forward in mathematics and star science. And it was all done by one man with a primitive telescope and an instinctive understanding of the cosmos. Stonehenge Engineering Secrets Stonehenge was not built in a day. Archaeologists agree it took at least four main phases to complete the famous megalith located in the English countryside. Work began roughly 5,000 years ago, and the Neolithic builders finished their masterpiece 1,500 years later. That's hard to grasp in the modern mind, a single building project ongoing for over 15 centuries. And throughout it all, the ancient builders used primitive tools crafted out of stone and deer antler. 
But what was the secret to the longevity of Stonehenge? It's been standing erect for an extremely long time, seemingly impervious to the wear and tear of Mother Nature. Archaeologists believe the endurance of Stonehenge can be attributed to a clever ancient building technique. These stones were interlocked by using drilled holes and protruding pieces. Think of Lego. Each huge piece of stone either had holes for fitting the studs or it had studs for fitting into the holes. When these stones were put in position, they interlocked just like perfectly matching Lego pieces or Lincoln logs. Experts call it a mortise and tenon system, and it goes to show just how incredibly brilliant the builders of Stonehenge were. The smart idea is also the only thing keeping 17 of the original stones standing upright, with five of the capstones still in their original position from five millennia ago. Roman Surgery in the year 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted with all the fury of the gods. The Roman city of Pompeii was buried under multiple layers of ash, preserving the city in stone as its residents and buildings were frozen solid. The Roman city of Herculaneum suffered the same fate. When archaeologists excavated these two petrified cities centuries later, they found artifacts from ancient Rome preserved as if they had been made yesterday. Some of these artifacts were surgical instruments, highly advanced medical tools recovered from a structure in Pompeii known as the House of the Surgeon. The collection of surgical tools taken from the house is now considered the best surviving example of surgery equipment from the 1st century AD. What's really shocking is that medicinal practices in ancient Rome were highly advanced. Some of the tools they used didn't change until late in the 20th century. Specifically, surgical tools used in gynecological operations were almost identical to the tools doctors are still using today. Then there are other, more bizarre surgical instruments. The bone forceps were used for removing pieces of the human skull during cranial surgery. The portal probe case was taken by surgeons to do house calls. The probe case contained all the necessary pokers and probes used by doctors to make diagnoses. Roman surgeons used obstetrical hooks for raising blood vessels and small pieces of tissue. They used epilation forceps for the removal of hair, and they had scalpels, surgical scissors, dozens of different probes, and lots of other stuff. They were almost better equipped than a lot of modern doctors. The Stairway of Fountain About 550 years ago, the great Inca city of Machu Picchu looked a lot different than it does today. Along the steep ascending staircase moving through the ancient city to its peak, there are currently empty square chambers covered by short grass. But in the year 1450, when the city was powerful, these stone squares were part of an impressive engineering project. On either side of the stairway was a network of water fountains, 16 in total, which worked to supply fresh drinking water for the residents. The fountains also would have been quite the sight to behold. They were powered by what may have been the most advanced example of hydraulic engineering in South America. The incredibly genius Inca engineers built a permeable wall, which worked to connect seeping water into a stone canal. The canal was also connected to a spring to help collect even more rainwater. Water was then pushed through Machu Picchu in a canal roughly 5 inches deep, carrying an estimated 80 gallons per minute. Charles Ordloff, a professional hydraulic engineer, says no other royal residences or Inca settlements boasted anything like it. The canal system was totally unique to Machu Picchu, passing through the outer wall, through agricultural zones, and into the residential zone. That was where the water flowed into the 16 fountains, each of which was publicly accessible. The cascade of water dropped a total vertical distance of 65 feet down to the last fountain located within the Temple of the Condor. The Wheel There has been no greater invention in human history than the wheel. Some could argue antibiotics, the telephone, the light bulb, but the wheel was truly one of the first great inventions and a major game changer. Nobody knows exactly when it happened, but archaeologists have a pretty good idea. Surprisingly, it was fairly late. People invented sewing needles and basket weaving, they built boats to sail across the ocean, Humans played music from primitive bone flutes, and all the while, for thousands of years, nobody figured out how to make a wheel. The very first wheels weren't even used for transportation. Around 3500 BC in Mesopotamia, 
wheels were first used for pottery. It took about three centuries before humans realized they could use them to make chariots, creating the world's first horse-powered vehicle. Wheels then revolutionized the globe. The best example comes in the form of the wheelbarrow. Around the 6th century BC in classical Greece, someone realized they could put a wheel on a bucket and save themselves a lot of time moving material. Wheelbarrows were incredibly expensive to purchase, but paid for themselves within a week. Being able to move a full load in a bucket attached to a wheel saved an unprecedented amount of time. The wheelbarrow was likely one of the first major technological advances that cost laborers their jobs. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye!